Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening. Depends upon where you are in this world. It's Captain Mike Dugan and myself, Bill Gustin, and we're holding down the fort. Mike's up in New York City or New York State, I should say, and I am in a very uh, desolate an empty training division because except for recruit training, everybody in Miami-Dade Fire Rescue is uh, operating at the scene of that collapse that occurred on um, June 24th. So I had really, I picked this topic, well, Mike and I collaborate on, on topics and uh, we always run topics back and forth. And it, it the topic this month is uh, to what extent do you train your department, your operations companies, not special ops companies, operations companies and special operation disciplines like uh, hazmat uh, and technical rescue, rope rescue, confined space. Do they have a certain level of at least awareness training? Can they get the scene started? And this is critical, uh, it's said, I think we got to all agree that the outcome of an incident can be determined by the actions that are taken by the first arriving companies in those first few critical minutes. Uh, I know at this collapse, uh, the rescues that were made were made largely by companies that were not uh, any have any special capabilities, or there were there were fire companies, and uh, they they are equipped with some rescue equipment, but. Um, we just can't wait for these specialized units. And, and I think, uh, frankly, I think throughout the fire service, uh, we've become in a sense, overly reliant on some of these special ops units. Like we're gonna wait around for a, um, a special uh, 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 a heavy squad or a, a hazmat uh, company to arrive on the scene. Uh, we have to take some action. We don't wanna take the wrong action but we have to at least set the, uh, the, 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 uh, the site up. So um, Captain Mike and I were just talking about uh, off camera about the um, operating conditions of our, our folks there in, um, in Miami-Dade and, and Mike is no stranger to that. Uh, God bless him working uh, at ground zero for as long as he did. Uh, I'm no stranger to it because I, responded to earthquakes in uh, Armenia and the Soviet Union. So I kind of know what these folks are going through and it's, it's pure misery. Uh, it's oppressively hot, it's pouring rain. Uh, and that brings the decomposing of the smell of the decomposing bodies. It's, it's not, it's, it's, it's pure misery. What makes it bearable, it's making it bearable, is that, and I have to reach out, my heart goes out to these guys in, in behalf of our entire fire department, thanking every task force, urban search and rescue task force, from within the state that responded, Virginia Beach, Fairfax, uh, Ohio, uh, I believe Indianapolis, and I think... Um, uh, I talked to Joey Alvarez uh, from Maplewood, New Jersey. So I imagine that the New Jersey task force was there and all hands were needed. Additionally, the Israelis, um, I had some contact with them in Armenia uh, back in 1988. They're a uh, pretty squared away group with a lot of experience. And I think they did something very good. There's a lot of folks that are... Uh, perished and are still unaccounted for of the uh, Jewish faith, uh, many Orthodox. And uh, they brought in the Israeli team and the team assured these families that had they been first on the scene, they would have begun and operated exactly like Miami Dade, which brought some level of comfort to these families. So Mike and I were talking about how quickly um, you can recall things and um, that you've put out of your mind for a while. And, uh, you know, it brings back bad memories, frankly. Uh, but it is great to know that we do have a, uh, a system in place now, uh, an urban search and rescue system uh, that was developed 
basically at the National Fire Academy, and I sat across the table from uh, Ray Downing because we were on the equipment committee together. And we taught a few classes together, but it's, we've come a long way. And uh, I think we've got something that is world-class throughout this country. And it doesn't matter where you're located. Uh, in a big campaign like this, you, could, you never know where you're going to end up. But we, I really, really have to thank the, the, the task forces. Mike, any reflection? Any thoughts? Well, a couple of thoughts, Bill, that I really think are very important for us. First off, as you said, uh, the smell. And we were ground zero. It happened on September 11th. And September, October, um, when we recovered a lot of bodies, the smell, that smell of decomposing flesh will always bring me back always bring me back. I don't know why, but that smell, that certain smell will always bring me back. And it can be momentary or it can be triggering a little uh, whatever. So um, the thing that is very, very important because we just had a brother in Florida uh, commit suicide in West Palm Beach is the need for help for these people coming out of there. And I know they're knee deep in it right now. And they're doing all they can to give these families closures and everything else. But for the weeks and the months after it, they're going to need some help. And having your support team there, your counselors there, um, the counseling unit, uh, very honestly, through the FDNY saved my life, saved my marriage. I was coming home. I was drinking too much. My little Emily was, um, six years old and she looked at me and said, daddy, why are you always mad? Why are you always angry? And um, the biggest punch I ever took in my life was from the six-year-old. It buckled my knees. I'm like what? And my wife said, the kids are scared of you. They were afraid because you're on such an edge. And that's when I had to go get help. And very honestly, uh, I will tell each and every one of you, there is no shame in getting help. Far from it. The shame is not getting help and drinking yourself out of a marriage, out of a job or whatever, or substance abusing yourself out of a job, out of a marriage, okay? Losing your family because you're internalizing all this. Now, I also tell this whenever I talk to people who are in the industry to help us, the clinicians, the uh, counselors and everything else, don't take offense, but we're a different breed. We have a different feeling on all of this. I, they introduced me to three count. I had three different counselors. My first counselor was a very young counselor. She was a wonderful young lady, but she was 23 years old. I could not click with her because she was my niece's age. You know, I was like, this is not going to work. I can't talk to you. We are so far apart. My second counselor never stood a chance because unfortunately she had a very high squeaky voice. And to me, and it's personal, it was like fingernails on a chalkboard. And I was like, oh, sorry, this is not gonna work. And my third counselor turned out to be a New York City, retired New York City police officer. And he was, he had walked the same streets I had been on. He had been in the same neighborhoods I worked on. And uh, my wife used to call him my boyfriend and say, you're getting a little edgy there, kid. When are you going to see your boyfriend? And I said, oh, I got, a, I got an appointment this week. Good, good. Go get help. Talk to him. Get it out. Get it out. And honestly, it's the best thing I ever did. Okay. It brought me leaps and bounds. Okay. For the people who are there, the people who were there, if you start seeing a change, Go talk to somebody and talk to whoever is in your life, the people you love, whether it's your parents, whether it's your brothers and sisters, whether it's your husband, your wife, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, it doesn't matter. Talk to those people and give them access. And if they say, listen, you're starting to get angry. You're having nightmares. Things are happening. You're drinking more than you were, whatever it is. If those people say those things, take them to heart and go talk to somebody. OK, because that's where you're going to need help, Bill. That's where Miami-Dade is going to need help now. We are. We do have uh, 
some good cl clinicians. I was blessed with uh, a clinician who was my dad. Of all the people that I came to see, it was my dad, 33 years on the Chicago Fire Department. And I called him up. My dad's a man of great faith, a devout Catholic. And I said, Dad, why did God do this to these poor people in Armenia, 50,000 people killed? Why did God do that? My dad said, Bill, I've been reading up on the building construction in Soviet Armenia. God didn't do that. The crappy Soviet building code is what killed all those people. And he was spot on right. He was spot on right. Everything was precast. It was put together like a kid was putting buildings together with blocks and hardly any reinforcing steel in it and no what no whatsoever welded embedments where a beam would be the metal embedded in a girder would be uh, welded to a column. None of that existed. And it just shook those buildings down. I got to give a shout out to somebody else here. We've got heavy equipment operators uh, that are absolutely, totally into this and are absolute masters of their craft. Uh, I heard a, kind of an interesting story. They have a machine there that looks like a backhoe, but the, the working end is, it looks like alligator jaws or crocodile jaws. And it can squeeze several thousand, hundred thousand pounds and just crushes the concrete and cuts through the rebar. A guy dropped a shovel or a broom, I can't remember, as the story was told to me, and it slipped down the pile. This guy took the machine so guys wouldn't have to climb back down the pile, took the machine and picked up that broom or shovel and brought it back up without even a mark on it shows you that that, mach that man, that machine is an extension of his body. So, and, and Mike, um, I don't want to say they're the unsung heroes, but you know, you, you, you had iron workers, God bless them. And uh, who better to take a building apart than guys that put it together? Could, can you speak about the iron workers and the heavy equipment operators for, for just a minute? Oh, my God. The iron workers were amazing. They were unbelievable. I was working with a group of iron workers on the first day, on September 11th, and they were just unbelievable. And then I was down there at Ground Zero about midnight, and somebody came up and gave me a shake and said, what are you doing here? And I said, what do you mean? He goes, you're on duty in the firehouse tomorrow for 24 hours. Didn't you know that? I said, no, nobody reached out to me. They said they've been trying to call you, but your cell phone's not working. But you have to man a company tomorrow. So you've got to go home and get a little bit of sleep because you are going You are going to be working 24 hours. I ended up working the next day in the quarters of 231 with a company from um, New Jersey that I uh, manned their rig with them, but went back that night and worked again with the iron workers and the heavy equipment operators. The iron workers were amazing, cutting up the steel beams because the World Trade Center was a lot of steel beams. The guys who were using the torches, they, were, they knew everything that was gonna happen before it happened. They knew where it was gonna move, how it was gonna bend. They were just, they were professionals. And they were fearless. They were working in there with us. And they were part of what we were doing. And the heavy equipment operators, as you said, the grapplers, they call them grapplers, the ones that come up and pick up all that stuff. The guys operating those grapplers, they could pick up probably a postage stamp. And they were just unbelievable. And then we had the heavy cranes come in that could lift up other things. And again, in the beginning, we tried not to move anything. We tried not to move anything in there because of everything going on with those machines. But when we phased from the rescue to the recovery operations, they could move tons of material. And again, for the fire department, pre-incident um, 
relationships with these men and women in these industries. If we need you, you've got to come. And they are amazing. I mean, these people took um, their machines from all over the city and just uh, get us an escort and we'll come down. We'll be down tomorrow. You know, it's going to take us four hours to travel the machine, but get us an escort. And it was unbelievable. And the other thing that was amazing for us was nobody was allowed in the city of New York for the first two days. All of the, you had to have an ID to get in. And, um, Everybody else was turned away. Go back to work. Go back home. You're not going to work. You're not going anywhere. Go back home. And it was just amazing that the NYPD was not letting anybody into the city of New York. It was martial law. I think there's some takeaways from today's session. Uh, one is seek help and don't be afraid to ask for help. Uh, the other is, and you just made a, a very important point, and it's a huge takeaway, Captain Mike is establish these relationships beforehand. Your heavy equipment operators, crane operators, your uh, wrecking and recovery. I'm talking about major league uh, heavy rotating wreckers, cranes on wheels. Uh, make these arrangements beforehand, uh, iron uh, workers, so that God forbid something happens, uh, at least you, you, know, you can put a name with a face um, and I'm sure that uh, there's a cooperative spirit there uh, that was developed in, in large part beforehand, like you, because we did follow your instructions and we had established these, these rapports. Uh, I want to give a shout out to uh, our friends at Keyhoes. That's keyhoes.com. Uh, it's being dragged around our training center right now out in the... Uh, I don't know, it's, the heat index is way over 100 right now, but it's being dragged and over windowsills, around corners, up stair treads, and uh, it gets beat up. And the true test of any piece of equipment is give it to recruit training because it's used so much. And um, when I was in the field, that's what we used. So it's a, it's a hearty endorsement for me. Uh, as I say every month, take the key challenge. Go out and try to... Um, Go out and try to kink it. So we have somebody. Oh, yeah, man. Yep. Did you bring that up, Mike? No, Bobby did. Okay. All right. Bobby did. I got, I got a couple more good examples here, too. That's a closer one. Can you full Here's screen it. that, Bobby? So yeah. our so here's another one. So you look at the size of that piece of equipment. So yep. when, we, when we were down there, that's one of those grabbers. Grab that, guy, grab that guy could. That that guy was amazing. He could he could grab stuff and hold stuff. How how is this coming? Can I make it bigger? What do you want me yes. to do? Mike? Up on the top where it says the full box. Go to the full screen. Up to on share? the top. Nope. Up above that. Nope. Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. Above that. Right oh, there. Go. Full yeah. screen. Click that. There you go. There you go. What do you think of that? Huh? Yep. So that yeah. that. That was a pretty interesting one. Let me uh, see what else I could find here for you. That'd give you some good, some good. Because these are the guys. When I got down there, these were some of the guys that that uh, I was kind of interfacing with for Norman. And this was another good guy. So this guy here's a pretty good example. So see all the debris this guy has in here. Yep. So this guy was lifting it up, and then a bunch of the guys from the different teams, the FDNY guys mostly. At that point, it was mostly FDNY and guys from Long Island and stuff. They would come and all of that got searched before it went to fresh kills. All of it, every, every single piece of wire, every single piece of, you know, there were, de there's, there's all kinds of stuff in there, right? You can see kind of the outline of the desk up at the top there or the, whatever it was. So these guys were just, a, they were just amazing people. They were, I mean, I mean everybody was amazing people there. Here's a, uh, here's a shot of which one we got here. This was, uh, let's see. So that that was um, oh I'm trying to think of that captain's name he was a great guy but you can see here here are your guys trying to wet that down cool it down and then the the big heavy equipment guy would come in next I think I got a shot of him coming in next and picking it That's up a lot of 131 the happy hookers is that 131 yep you can see it on the bucket on the boom okay happy hookers let me find a shot here's a 
if this is uh, I've, got, I've got a gazillion shots here. Let me see what this one looks like. Oh, here's a great shot. This is a good shot. So that gives you an idea, you know, of all the different pieces of equipment. You can see a piece of equipment over in the corner here. You can see it. these are all the guys that, that were down in there. And if you look at it, it, most of it, a lot of these guys came from, um, oh, what was the name of the company? Um, the same guys that built the um, Turner, Turner Construction. Turner. Yeah, okay. Yep. Yep. Turner, Turner. And, and uh, you know, this was one of my favorite shots that they, that they did just because one of the first thing those guys did, and I got it sideways, they hung the flag and I tried to get their, their equipment in there. You they can rotate that. that. You can rotate huh? that up top. In the middle of the, the picture next to the love is the rotated. Okay, I'm looking for in the middle of the picture. Next middle to of the picture, up top, see the rotate next to the heart. Next to the heart, okay, to the right of the heart. You're this almost there. I don't even see the heart. At the top of the picture, um, center of the screen. Okay. Go right up a little more. Yeah. Or it nope. says, for me, it says participants. I got the... Uh, okay. I got the, Close out, um, minimize the participants. Um, I'll move it down here so it's out of my way. I see what you're saying. Next to the heart, got it. Okay, so, okay. There you go. All so, right, there you go. So, so what a nice. So the reason I like that shot a lot when I was trying to just so I'd be able to tell people what we saw there. You got all of this equipment here. This is all the cutting stuff that they were using. You got a bunch of the guys staged over here. These are all construction guys. But one of the first things they did was they hung the flag and, and they put up these, these nettings on the buildings so that some of this glass came loose with all the vibration and such. It didn't hurt any of the men and women that were working down here. Because back in here, um, I think that's West Street. I think we're looking towards West Street there, Mike. I think so too, yes. Uh, if I'm not mistaken. If I'm not mistaken, I could be. So if you look over there, I got a picture of, so this is, um, we just come back from a funeral and we we're checking in at West Street before we put our shit on. This is uh, underneath that, under, underneath what you see there, were these guys. And they're all, they're all workers. So th uh, this is Sal, um, John Paulson, and, and these guys are, are, you know, from Turner or whoever. Yep, they union were. workers, yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let me see what else I have, Bill. There's a couple of interesting shots as we talk about 9-11. Let me, let me pose a question to both of you guys. Yeah. <clears throat> She's calling me. Diane oh, Ross Child wants to talk to me. Uh, <laughs> hey, Diane, come on. Uh, this is my big cameo appearance here. Um, scary. I think it's scary. When you look at a crane operator, you look at uh, an excavator operator, there's no kids, there's no kids. And there's no young people that are coming in behind these old veterans to run these machines. I, I have to tell you, Bill, I disagree because I see a lot of young kids coming in to do it in the, um, in the industries in New York and a lot of them are um, military veterans coming in to do this from um, military backgrounds and things like that. And they're getting into the unions. Now, some of the unions are still having problems getting people to come in and work because of the extra money that we are giving people to stay home. No, say it isn't so. Well, uh, my favorite- I was, wait, I was waiting for somebody to go there. My favorite restaurant that's around the corner from uh, Bobby's sister and brother uh, is not going to be open till September because they can't get wait staff. Yeah, and yeah. their food is their food is excellent. Bob, I've got I got to talk, I got to talk to Diane. You guys keep talking. I'm just going to put myself on mute. So I'll okay. I'll keep putting up some pictures for you guys to see while while you're talking. If that's okay. a, if that's what you'd like, Bill. Well, we're gonna we're gonna uh, move on to our our topic that we we Mike and I picked. And it has to do with uh, to what extent do you train your your operations companies in special ops skills? Uh, to, and that 
to the extent that they're trained is going to determine how uh, engaged they can be prior to the arrival of a, of a, of a heavy squad uh, or a hazmat unit. Yep. Uh, I spent most of my career in the, in the uh, fire service without a hazmat team and without technical rescue teams and conscientious fire officers and firefighters would take it upon themselves to study, uh, attend schools, attend classes, and educate them Absolutely. themselves Absolutely. on technical rescue skills. So we had a, we had a customs agent uh, overcome by carbon monoxide down in a uh, cargo hold of a ship, which was not a, uh, an unusual event on the Miami River. Well, we're going to have to rig up a two-to-one mechanical advantage uh, just with carabiners. You know, you don't have to take a, a week class on rope rescue to figure out how to do that. All right. And, and, uh, and also, we realized that it was the carbon monoxide from, from a, a pump that was running down there. Uh, it happens with forklifts. We also took a guy out of a, uh, the engine room of a tugboat. And that required some, we had to wrap that guy up like a mummy with tubular webbing. But we could not wait for a special ops unit to arrive. And I listen to conversations as I go around the country. Well, we have to, when Hazmat gets here, hey, we can't wait for Hazmat to get there. Anyway, if you are a conscientious firefighter or fire officer, you're going to know the properties and the mitigation procedures for your common fuel liquids and gases, LP, propane, butane, isobutane, and hydrous ammonia. We used to get tons of leaks before they started cracking down on these cold storage plants. It was like an every week occurrence, we'd get an ammonia leak. We need to know how to keep this, the fuel from getting into the sewers. We need to know these properties. So we, there at least has to be a, a, a somewhat of a, a maybe a, not a mastery of it because that's a special discipline. But we want to get the scene set up. Mike, you were telling me a story about um, a guy I, up underneath the subway and um, you couldn't wait for a rescue to get there. Couldn't wait for a rescue to get there. Even though when I was in Brooklyn, rescue was close by. But we don't know where they were at that point. They could have been on the run and everything else. We had a train operator and whether the guy, I don't know. And I will, we will never know until uh, my time comes. And I see that guy again, um, if what I believe is true, but that guy fell in front of a train, whether he jumped, whether he fell, whether he had a medical emergency, I'll never know. But the train hit him and he was two and a half cars back. And I'll never forget the part of that that will stay with me forever is the poor train operator. And she was shaking like a leaf and like, did I kill him? Did I kill him? He said, I don't know. And then I looked at one of the guys and I said, okay, we got to go under there. And I looked at one of the, the MTA guys and I said, do you swear on your kid's life? Because I'm leaving this fireman up here as my radio contact. If I get electrocuted, I told him to put a halligan through your head. Okay. Do you swear that the power is off? And he goes, absolutely, the power is dead. I guarantee it, the power is dead. I go, okay. And we went under there, and this guy was in a black hoodie under the train. And I went in there, and I'm looking, and I can't see his head. And I'm like, oh, be careful. Don't cl crawl on his head. And then he picked his head up, and he went, uh, and he moved. And I'm like, okay, we got to go in there and make him. So we started getting our stuff down there. We got our, um, our Stokes basket, our backboard. We got him into the backboard. We tied him up. We had to lift him uh, under the train. And then we had to slide him back and around so we could get him up because he had cut the bottom of one of his feet off at the ankle. And his other leg was um, cut at the, in the middle of the uh, lower calf. And we had to get him up quickly because of, you know, we couldn't put a tourniquet. We couldn't take time. And we were trying to stop the bleeding. We packaged him. We got him up. They worked on him on the platform and they got him to the hospital a lot. He ended up dying. He passed away. But you don't have time. You don't have time. So you better have an idea of what you're going to do 
when you are going to do these things. If someone is, um, I had a friend who I grew up with him and his brother, they were twins and his brother and I became cops together. But um, uh, this gentleman went down in a storm drain to get a ball for kids in a field. He was a uh, county employee and they were dumping grass clippings down there. Somebody else went down first. He went down second. Somebody else went down third and a cop went down fourth. Three of them died. Okay. Um, because of it was methane gas from the decomposing grass. You better have an idea of what you're going to do when you show up there. And you don't want to be number five, six or seven going down there because if it already happened to those people, it's going to happen to you unless you take some kind of action to mitigate it, whether it's an air supply, something else to protect yourself. You have to know what you are going to do in these situations. Now, there are times you get into places and you don't know that it's a special ops. It's a hazmat. Um, we can talk about that because that happened to me as a, uh, a young fireman. Um, on a uh, holiday weekend, we were watching football on Thanksgiving and we went to a fire in a basement and they were doing asbestos removal. And we didn't know they were doing asbestos removal. And we got down there in the smoke with the line, with the tools and everything else. And we are covered with asbestos because they were just putting it in black garbage bags at the time. We are covered. Well, back in the day, the New York City decon unit showed up and hooked up to a hydrant. And we got these wonderful GI cold showers, <laughs> take all your clothes off. And then they put us in a white Tyvek suit. Anybody who's ever met me knows I'm about 6'5". And at the time I was probably 240. I'm a little over that now, but I'm telling you right now, they don't make those suits for guys my age, my size. I bent over at the time. And the next thing I know, the cold breeze was blowing uh, where mama never kissed me. Uh, it was not fun at all. You better have a plan for what you're going to do. You better have an idea. You better have an awareness of what is going on around you. Okay. And if something looks weird, something's happening, pay attention to it. One thing that uh, I, I would do a lot in terms of technical rescue. If we had anything other than just a simple door pop on a motor vehicle accident, in other words, if the, if the vehicle itself was impinging on any part of the patient, no matter how confident I was that we could get this, this person out and do it properly, I would immediately ask for a technical rescue unit. Uh, I'm not going to exhaust. Sometimes we get involved, especially if we are not physically detached. We don't know when to stop doing the wrong thing for too long. We have to shift to a plan B or a plan B to C. Well, let's get the guys rolling. Get, get the specialists going that have the specialized tools, the specialized skill, and get them, get them rolling. And 99% and of the time, we can cancel them before they get there. But get them going. And if a, I had a family member trapped, that's what I would want. Uh, don't exhaust every means possible before you ask for a, a technical rescue company. I will mention that uh, getting back to this collapse, that uh, the majority of the people that were plucked off of those balconies with the tower ladders, uh, those aren't special ops units. And also, uh, to my brother and sister firefighters on Miami Day. They had no way of knowing that at any moment the rest of that building could have come, come down on them. But that was a, Mike, it was like the decision you made with the, with the subway car. Is it worth the risk? Is it worth the risk? And so many times we operate where it's not worth the risk. The risk isn't justified. This was worth the risk because our, our number one job is not to take care of ourselves. And, and don't take this the wrong way, Bobby, but it's not to avoid cancer. It is to be our brother's keepers. We, we truly are. And that means that sometimes we are going to have to put ourselves at greater risk because the public is a greater risk. I'm looking at a, a task force two there, which would be um, 
could be anywhere uh, outside of Miami Dade um, on, on that picture. Uh, Bobby, uh, if you got that picture, I sure uh, do. Yeah. So let me tell you a little about this picture. And I think it's a germane to the conversation. So we're talking about calling in outside experts. What you're seeing there is Florida Task Force Two, and the gentleman he's talking to is the head of the Israeli team. And uh, what's fascinating about the conversation is that the head of the Israeli team, uh, this uh, this gentleman here, I'll show. Uh, let me get over here. This is uh, if I can try and bring bring this picture over here. I'm trying to try to bring multiple pictures in. So I don't know where they're going. Here we go. So I got it working now. So here's the uh, let me get rid of this one. Here's the his, here's his boss. Um, I don't know if you're seeing this. Here's his boss. I don't know if you recognize this, but this is Indiana Task Force. Yep. Yep. We're, vis we're visiting with them there. And there's the chief. And Chief Malone, that's correct. And the head of their task force. Yep. And so this gentleman here is he's in charge of the um, of the Israeli team. And he had been working. What was interesting about that is I think I'm trying to find a picture of him at at, at this event with us. But what was interesting was the Indy team had fortuitously been assigned at the exact same time. Uh, here, here he's in this photo here. The Indy team had been as assigned at the exact same time as the Israelis. So having had already built up a great relationship, here's the here's a shot of the building we worked on in, in, in Indy with the, uh, is, the Israelis came out to train on. Um, this is the this is a, a old shopping mall that they collapsed in Indy. We take, took this out of a helicopter ride uh, that we took, but the Israelis were down here teaching the Indy guys how they manage because they have a great deal of experience how they manage uh, these types of events. So, you know, you, you guys were talking a, a, a moment ago about you know building relationships ahead of time. So when these Israeli guys got there. The Indy Task Force guys who had worked with them for a couple of weeks at that site because they that we they had that site for for a good amount of time um, they they developed a rapport so you had a pre-established relationship um, with, with at least with at least not only the Indy team but they had a really good understanding of how the American teams manage their their systems right so they, they were able to interface just seamlessly and and. I haven't spoken to them since you know they were down at Surfside, but um, I'm, I'm sure they were invaluable. Uh, they're, they're really fine, fine people, and and they're exactly like us. But their system is a little bit different, you know, uh, nomenclature, you know, what we call things. So when you when you do those pre-established deals, you know, especially in training, boy, can it pay off. And to Mike's point, you know, calling in a specialist is great, and but oftentimes. Like I'm old enough to remember when we didn't have a lot of, you know, when I was on the job in Albuquerque, we didn't have a, a special high high angle team at that point in time. I know they do now. We didn't have a trench team. I know they do now. But we used to go to trench rescues all the time. You know, uh, uh, someone would be digging a trench and, and we had type C soil, which is really, really unstable soil because the moisture content is so low. So routinely, so routinely, I got John, and of all people, I got John O'Connell calling me in my ear here. So let me t tell John, I'll talk to him in a second. John, hang on, I'll talk to you in a second. So um, I'm doing a hangout. So, you know, being able to handle those things, the specialized units are critically important. But one of the things to remember is that a lot of the guys and gals that are listening to us live in communities that don't have a trench team. They don't have a technical rescue team. They've got to they've either interface with the communities around them or they've got to figure out how to make a safe situation that they can operate in with what they have. And to that point with Bobby, to that point with Bobby, that's where those other relationships outside of the fire service come into to play. The vacuum truck from Con Ed or the uh, vacuum truck for the like, local landscaper that can help you get the, the unstable soil from around that person. The things that can help you save those people's lives. Those are the pre-incident relationships that you have to foster. 
and you have to make work for your department. You have to figure out what you are going to do in this emergency. If they are doing trench rescue, they are doing trenches, they are building trenches in your neighborhood and they're not, you don't have a trench rescue, you better figure out how you're gonna get somebody out of there because they're gonna call you, okay? And you don't wanna be standing there looking like a fool with no idea about what to do. So you have to foster those relationships and you have to figure out where the closest trench rescue company is and start them out, start as Bill said, those specialists out on the way in to help you. But you have to figure out how you can help those persons by doing no additional harm and what you can hopefully do to save them. Yeah, my, and I've gotta, I gotta make a point here, um, fellas, that um, at this incident, my department has very strict controls over what is released on social media. And sometimes I've been at odds with them in disagreeing, but I am 100% in favor of having total strict control over social media when it comes to this. Uh, and I just want to make it clear that none of the pictures that are being shown today came from me or my department. I, I just have to get because otherwise somebody's going to somebody's eyebrows will be raising. So oh no, those are those are right. those are my personal photos. Yeah, there that's fine. That that's absolutely fine. Uh you you came in a little late, but I think it bears repeating. God bless those Israelis. Boss, the first thing they told these Jewish families, uh and, and, you know, that building is in large part Jewish, or some Orthodox Jews. They assured that those families that had they been the first team on the scene, they would have began and conducted operations exactly like Miami did, which, which brought them some measure of comfort. And, and, you know, that brings up another really important point, too. It's different cultures and religions, um, funeral and, and, and uh, services as such, you know, death issues, Native Americans, our Jewish friends, our Muslim friends, they have they have um, time frames and such that they abide by. So it was really heartening to see the rabbis on site and the imams on site and the priests on site. And don't ever diminish the need for that spiritual technical rescue side of what we do. I mean, we get so focused on moving the steel and the concrete and you know, and, and, and obviously focused on if there's anybody left alive, obviously that's the, you know, that always comes first, but respect for the, for the, for the casualties, for the, for the, for the KIA is, you know, you can't overemphasize that how, how you, how you handle um, someone's loved one at that point in time, the amount of respect that you show for whatever aspect of that person you may be responsible for, be, act responsibly, because that memory, you know, the Israeli, the Israeli officer telling the families, as Bill just said, wouldn't have done a darn thing different. That's so gratifying for them to hear from someone who they implicitly relate to, trust, whatever, right? Just seeing someone, you know, making sure that, and, and we forget, you know, we, we get, we're working and we're talking and you know, uh, even just a smile or a joke can, if somebody sees it and they don't know what you're smiling or joking about, can be taken in, 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 such, a, in such a terrible way. And, um, and, and, we, and it was the furthest thing from our minds, right? We're just trying to gallows humor or whatever to help one another cope. So in, in this day of cell phones and, and all the rest of it, you know, you just have to be so careful and, um, um, and to Bill's point, just if anybody asks, all those photos are my personal property. They were sent to me, you know, many of them, I, most of them I took except one. So, you know, or they were taken of me and given to me by the photographers. And, and the, the Israeli officer there is a friend of mine. So, um, and I'm not using his name so that he doesn't get in trouble <laughs> for having his name released over the air without, without his boss giving him permission. So it's, it's nice to be a publisher because when somebody sends me something, I own it <laughs> and I can do what I want with it. So can I say something too, Bobby, along these lines, and it kind of touch, touches yeah. what you're saying and what Bill's saying. Yeah. Because I remember being down at Ground Zero 
and some people came by to help and they weren't FDMY and they're standing on a pile and they got a camera and they say to somebody I know, hey, could you take our picture? And the guy says, sure, give me the camera. He took the camera and he threw it as far as he could and smashed it. It went to, and the guy, what the hell did you do that for? This is hallowed ground. This is not a photographic place to be. You are on hallowed ground. You are not taking pictures of yourself being here. You are on hallowed ground. And I agree with the media policy of Miami-Dade and I know all the pictures have been sent to you. Afterwards, we can talk about this, but that person, that recovery operation going on is someone's mother, father, sister, brother, husband, wife, son or daughter. Mm -hmm and they are loved. And we, recovering them, are giving this family something to grieve. And well, we were, not, to Mike's not, point too, so people should know, even you know, back in the day uh, in 2001, when I was down there, D D D Commissioner Dan Nigro, who was acting commissioner at the time because or Peter had been killed, in chief of department, I'm sorry, because Peter had been killed, um, you know, he, that photographer, he sent down there with me, you know, and, and that guy was all over the place. Those are just the days I was there, but all of those photos, we weren't allowing anybody to take photos. You, you had to have permission from Dan Nigro. FDMY badge. F, there were two, there were two badges that you could, that you could respect. One that had Dan Nigro's name on it because they were issued at that event. And then ones that had um, the FBI director at the time, because the FBI guys were down there and they were taking a lot of those pictures. So some of those I got from FBI guys that sent them to me, but they were, the, the, the feds were all over, at that point, they were all over the place. And um, I, think, I think on that particular, some of those shots that day were the day that President Bush was down there, because um, a couple of those came from Secret Service people. But- um, And very honestly, Bobby, and this is to that on that whole point. Those pictures, we can look at the official pictures, we can look at later. And I know Miami right now is controlling every one of those pictures that's taken by their photographers, and they will be reviewed to make sure that nobody sees any uh, family members or anything else before they are made public. Then they will be made public and released, and we can hopefully get training on what what worked what was a problem and all of those other things but those pictures right and, somebody, and i have some of those types of pictures and i would never share them i just won't do it i mean if you can, if if it was the three of us sitting at the computer and, and we were trying to figure out a, a tactical issue with it or whatever fine but they're not i don't i would I have pictures of friends of mine being recovered. Yeah, we, yeah. And flag draped yep. uh, Stokes basket. And those are ours. I would never, ever in my entire life, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. I would never, ever share that with anybody who wasn't a brother or sister who was down there or been in something familiar. Yeah, I mean, if you if we were sitting, with, if Sal was sitting here with us right now, right, or right. that whole whole different story, right. you know. And hey, do you have a picture of that? Sure, here it is. But other than that, that's not for public consumption. Nope. It's just wrong, and 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 that's why people always ask us why why are we so strict about photography at things like FDIC? Well, because at FDIC, men and women are learning. And, and oftentimes a camera will intimidate people, but oftentimes, you know, we're not doing it exactly right. Like I've, I've gone to do some evolutions at FDIC and I've had people correct me. You know, I had a, a young man at um, Man Versus Machine who worked for- uh, um, Mark Gregory. Yeah, but he, he worked specifically for our friend out of Boston. Um, the chief out of Boston. Oh God. Oh, oh yes. Um, yeah. I can see his face right now. Come on. Yeah, me too. Anyway, the kid had to correct me and it was funny because they were videotaping us and uh, the guy videotaped says, should I cut that out? I'm like, no, shit. <laughs> he knows how to do it right. I'm doing it wrong. But if I'd been a student from someplace else, they'd be embarrassed. I, you can't embarrass me at my age. You know what I mean? Uh, you know what I mean? I'd, so it's interesting. The cameras are great and they can also be uh, detrimental 
You know what I mean? They can be bad. But back to the to the to the technical rescue uh, conversation. And again, it's a great conversation to have, and uh, I, I know you know folks are so busy, but you know the 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 when we, when we think of Ground Zero, you know, and and think about the guy we lost, Ray Downey. You know, you, you talk about technical rescue, and and then to get a phone call from a from a John O'Connell, you know, who was, you know, who, you know, one of the first people involved in you know the below grade rescue and collapse. And I mean, his nickname's Johnny Collapse. He wrote the book, you know, on on collapse and. Um, that level of expertise is, is really a handful of people, you know what I mean? And, and, and it's growing, but when you think back to Northridge, you know, and, and, and the early days that the vision that guys like Downey had to realize that, no, we need, you know, we need to, we need to have teams of people that, you know, we can deploy just, just like at Surfside. I, I don't know all the details. I haven't, you know, at this point, but, you know, at, at, uh, at the Murrah building, there was the mother of all slabs that Ray and, you know, there's a big discussion. Do we take it down? Do we leave it up? Do we take it down? That went back and forth for a couple of days. And I'm sure I heard there was something very similar about Surfside. Do we collapse it? Do we, you know, do we move this part? Do we move that part? Those are not simple conversations. I mean, they bring in engineers and they bring in, you know, construction people and they bring in, and, and then those men and women who've been doing this as an obsession, you know, for 10 and 20 years, then those guys get together and gals get together and they, you know, talk about, well, you know, we cut this here or we did that there. And, and I think that to have that, you know, for, our, for the younger members listening today, to have the access to that kind of brain power is just phenomenal. Because when you think about the guys like, you know, the Downies of the world, uh, that, 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 or even go back further to the O'Hagans of the world and the Stapletons of the world that had to operate before you could pick up a phone and talk to anybody in the world. They, they faced challenges that they had to figure out. And today we face similar challenges, but we can have, you know, the expression, more fingers on the knife. We can get, we can get more people to help us. And we should. I, I think one of the things that I'd like to say is don't hesitate to ask. I, I, I was always horrible with knots. I still am today. I, 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 I struggle tying my shoelaces. And, and I, was a king, I was the king of the granny knot. You know, I was a, the, and, and Chief Downey once, I was telling him that, and he goes, well, the simple overhand knot, it's a great knot. You know why? Few bends. And I was like, yeah. Because <laughs> you do what you do, use what you know. And I'm like, well, that's the only one I know, Chief. He goes, well, that's not good, but, you know. Uh. You know, Bobby, I, uh, my dad taught me how to tie knots, and, um, and he, he tied knots the Chicago, well, the Navy way, and then the Chicago way, which was very similar. Um, and when I was involved in technical rescue, I could tie the fig family of figure eight knots. But as a, as a matter of now, uh, if I was going to tie a harness on somebody, it would be a bull and on a bike because that's what I know. And it's just muscle memory, how to make it. And if I needed to secure something, it would be a clove hitch and a safety or, or a bowling. And it works. And, and I, I hear the argument, well, you know, you, you, uh, it weakens the rope. For God's sake, we got 9,000 pounds tensile strength on the rope. We're not going to break the rope, for God's sake. So it, uh, you work with what you got, you know, what you're comfortable with. My old man was on a squad. You know how proud I am talking about him. And his primary tools was a, a device called a stone jack, which was a mechanical advantage cog with a big lever, and and uh, I just saw one recently in North Carolina, and and an oxygen and acetylene torch, and, and the, that was that was the tools that they used. Yeah, we and called them a hijack. Went, we called that? them a hijack because they went up about thirty six inches. And you know that if you're going to get a, a high lift jack and attach it to the back of your pickup truck or your jeep. You know, you have to have that certification. You know what certification I'm talking about? You got to have redneck. the redneck certification. 
All right. You've got and you have to have a degree from MIT in redneck engineering. If you have that, then you're qualified with that high lift jack. But there is that that jack and the variations of it that what I was talking about. Uh, house movers used to use those things, but it's just mechanical advantage. And the other thing is it does require more skill and more ingenuity to be able to adapt these, these rudimentary tools to these types of things. Um, I, think, I think, I think what's cool too, is that, you know, your dad passed that down to you, you passed it down to other, other troops, but it, it's so cool when you have a chance for uh the, the troops to show you uh, what they know that either you've forgotten or you never knew. You know what I mean? That's what I like about FDIC walking around the hot is that folks teach me stuff all day long. I just want to show Bill one thing. I'm going to take a moment of personal privilege. I don't know if you can see that very well, but there he is. He's at work. That's drama right there. There's drama. Yeah. And is that a C-130? That's a C-130. Yeah. Here's his, uh, here's, here's drama's, here's drama's C-130. By the way, that was Pat Nicholas we were thinking about. Pat Nicholas, that's it. Pat Nichols. Nichols. Uh, yeah. Nichols. Pat Nichols. Nichols. Pat does Nichols. that have U.S. Navy on it, or is it? Sure uh, does. It does sure. have U.S. Navy on it. Sure does, buddy. Let me blow that up right here. You know, if I if I was an airplane, I would like to be a C-130. Maybe not oh, real good looking, yes, Navy, buddy, but, but highly, highly reliable. Now, getting off the subject. They have landed and taken off C-130s off of aircraft carriers, correct? If they use the JTO? I don't know. I'd have to ask my son. I, I, they, that, that, you know, Doolittle got the <laughs> B-17s off them. No, were they 17s or 25s? B-25s. Were they 25s? Yeah, because my dad flew a 26. Okay. But I, I don't know about C-130s. C-130s are awfully slow. I don't see it. Well, remember they have they have JTO, just yeah, to take off. Yeah, I know, but even with that, that that's a lot of weight to get moving fast. Yeah, you, know, you got to get it to a certain speed to go off, or else you're going over. The cool thing about that, this they, they can land, but they can land and take off on very short fields. So and they can back maybe. up too, can't they? Yeah, yeah, they can back up. Can back up. Very few airplanes have a reverse. Yeah, yeah they can back up. Yeah. So I don't know. I'd have to ask my kid. Yeah, yeah. Hey, um, I'm going to mention our, our, our good friends at Key Hose. That's keyfire, uh, keyhose.com. Uh, and namely, uh, my good friends, uh, Mark Lighthill and Dave Hibben. And I always like to mention Dave. He spent uh, many years as uh, an officer on DC Engine 10, which is uh, keeps himself pretty busy. And I'll make and, another uh, shout out for Key Hose and say if you're ever in Dotham, Alabama, you won't find a more welcoming place for a firefighter to show up. They, they'll treat you like you're a king. They'd love to see you, love to meet you. Um, they, they'll they let you have you know free run of the place. Check out how check out how hose is made. And they, they love to brag on it. It's an incredible facility in an incredible city. And Chief Larry Williams is the fire chief down there, who's just a absolutely marvelous guy. So if you're down in Dotham, Alabama, and you want to visit the key hose facility, they would love to meet you. They're just they're just the nicest people in the world. And there's probably not a friendlier town than Dotham, Alabama. And you know, those folks at Key, they listen. They're listeners because they want to satisfy the needs, meet the needs. And of course, most of them come from the fire service and meet the needs of what we have. Uh, and you know, Bill, in a few minutes we have left, I want to say that the folks at FDIC are listeners too. They and are, really. <laughs> And if okay. you're listening right now, we do still have some few spots open in the hands-on training. Workshops are filling up. The workshops are filling up really fast because it's summer school and people realize it's going to be warm. But we have a couple of really incredible uh, opportunities. Writ Under Fire still has a few slots left. Drilling at the Speed of Flashover has a few spots left. Man and Machine that we've been talking about. The Rope Class, which is a rope class, which is unbelievable. Um, we've been talking about technical rescue. Fantastic class. You really want to take a, a, a look at that. The, the saws class, all about saws. You know, I thought I knew a lot about saws till I sat down in that class. And, 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 and I, I'm hoping that I'll have a chance to take it in its entirety one of these days. Amazing class. 
still has spots left available in it. Um, you, you got Steve Robertson doing a stretching uh, for success, which is an amazing class. Um, we've got a couple of really great engine company classes as Aaron Heller's doing his commercial fire ops. So, you know, if you haven't signed up yet, you, you know, for, for your hands-on stuff, there's still slots available. Really encourage you to do that. Um, we're going to be recognizing uh, an incredible guy uh, for his lifetime achievement, Captain Mike Dugan. So I hope you can join us on Thursday for that. That's going to be an amazing day. We're going to have a fantastic keynote from Steve Chikorotis from, you know, and if you look at your, your cover this month uh, on fire engineering for, for July, it, it may it may stop you for a moment because it's very unusual. Read the blurb and then I hope you enjoy it when you look at the cover again. So yes. take a look at the cover and then read the blurb. And then we're also going to have a, a, a couple of really good friends, John Austin, who is the chief in um, 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 New, New Haven, Connecticut, uh, recently had a tragic loss of a firefighter there. And John's going to be speaking on Thursday and as well as Larry and, da and, Larry and David Conley. And what's so unique about Larry and David, it, A, it's the first time we've ever had two people present together. And the reason we're doing it is because the way that they've been training over the last 10 or 12 years, this program that they do about uh, leadership and empowerment, it's so unique and, and it's so powerful. And I couldn't imagine separating them when we have that opportunity to see these guys perform together. It'll be a microcosm of what you can get when you bring these guys in to do some leadership training which is so different and so powerful than anything else you've ever seen. It's just going to be an amazing deal. And then, of course, we have a workshop by, a, by an older fellow uh, out of Florida. Uh, we, have, we have people bringing him in from the home. Uh, Enrique promised us he'll have him there on time. He'll be working the, the clicker for him. So his slides will advance. I'm just teasing. Bill's yeah. got his work. I hope so, sign up for Bill's workshop and his, his classroom. And Mike will also be doing a, a classroom. So sign up for, you know, you don't have to sign up for the classrooms. There's no restrictions. The restaurants are open. The fun run is up. You can register for the fun run. The stop drop, the, the um, a stair climb is on. So the stair climb's happening. The fool's bash is happening. The union party is happening. So it's going to be a great chance to get out. The weather is going to be fantastic. We talked to the meteorologist, a lot of little, little meteorological people yesterday, and they said it should be in the mid to low 80s, which is perfect for training. It's great for running. Um, so I'm, I'm super excited. I'll be there in, well, 12 days. So I'll be there in 12 days setting things up and, and working with the team. Uh, really just, you know, just so grateful about 18,000 folks so far have signed up to, to which is great. Uh, you know, it's not our usual 35,000 uh, uh, that we get. We understand that, you know, it's a kind of an off time of the year. So we have slots available. We haven't cut back one thing. I mean, we, it's going to be a great year. If you want to do hands-on, a lot of the classes are going to be running at about 75%, you know, 50%. So you're going to get a lot more repetitions, a lot more chances to run through the, you know, the, the forcible entry, Chris Minicelli. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. Uh, uh, Bob Morris, uh, you've got, you've got um, the young lady from Florida who, uh, who was doing the- Jenny uh, Grama. Jenny Grama. 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 Yeah, that class, you know, amazing, amazing, just amazing. Just, a, it's just an amazing time. And, and a, it's a great celebration. And it's a chance to, uh, we have a, a new, a very brand new thing we're going to be doing on Wednesday night. Um, it's not going to be the regular unplugged. It's now it's now called After Hours, and you'll have Captain Dugan, and you'll have John Norman, and you'll have Rick Lasky and John Salka, and you can ask them any question you want. They'll all be up there on the stage. You can visit with them. So I really hope you take advantage of that. It's going to be a, a new era, a new uh, a new a new way to to spend your Wednesday evening. I think you'll enjoy it. So. Um, what, what, what am I? Am I chopped liver? I mentioned you several times. You're in, you're in, you're the first guy I said on, on after hours. Oh, <laughs> you mentioned me instead of him. Hey, I'm, a, I'm not hey, on I, it. He is. I, I got oh. feelings too. Oh yeah. Okay. So I'm sorry. Did I say you instead of him? Yes. I'm like, All right. I'm doing this now? Wait a second. Send him instead of me. Senior moment, my friend. Senior moment. <laughs> Hey, I think we're going to wrap this up. Uh, please remember, uh, everybody, 
that uh, the, the residents, the families, and the, uh, the firefighters, and the wonderful men and women of not only Miami-Dade, but the other uh, task forces that are giving us uh, help that we desperately need, and uh, the heavy equipment operators, again, some of the takeaways is build these relationships beforehand. And uh, until next month, uh, Captain Mike, I'll be talking to you and we'll collaborate on another uh, another topic. But uh, always good to see you guys and, and God bless you. And uh, we'll see you. Well, I'll see you in how many days? I'll see you in a few days. And uh, my daughter's coming, Captain Mike, because she wants to see you get that award. So uh, we'll see you next month. Goodbye, everybody. God bless.